I'd like to thank all of you for those lightning presentations. I know that's a lot of information, but what we wanted to make sure we did at, at the end of this day was to let you talk about what you want to talk about. So we have an hour for questions. We also know that we're in between you and the wine, but we really do want questions. So we have, we've made up some if nobody comes to the microphones. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> Ask a question, if I may, of Eben and the scribes. Is this on? I can't tell. The um, I'm curious. One of the things we struggled with, and I wonder if it would be beneficial for a cost-benefit analysis, even with $70,000 medical students, um, is uh, one of the things we've struggled with is standardizing documentation across varied um, uh, oncologists in our in our clinics uh, with an eye to capturing certain issues uh, in structured fields for quality reporting and the like. Have, have you taken it that far with the scribes? Since it seems like scribes would be easier to maybe transform the documentation issues than docs. Yeah, that goes with the axiom that if you don't have to ask the doctor to do anything, it's more likely to get done. The, the scri we have not asked the scribes to put in structured data, although um, we have looked at doing that. The biggest problem that we have with that is that uh, the physicians often want different things for different uh, subspecialties. So that's, uh, but I completely agree that that's an outstanding idea. Um, in terms of the cost-benefit analysis, um, we have looked at the cost per session, um, and it and it absolutely. Uh, does us well in terms of the wait times and the time in session. The biggest problem is is that it's very hard to put a number on physician well-being, and so uh, you know that's that's a, a hard number to to come to. I was just wondering. Um, we were saying that doing an inpatient rotation in medical oncology was one of the worst ways to convince someone to go into oncology, but it, your scribe experience seems to make people want to go to medical school. I just worry that in their first year of residency, they're going to be making less money than they were as a scribe <laughs> uh, beforehand. Good afternoon. Susan Denser from the Duke Margola Center for Health Policy. Um, question for Hugh Mom, but I'd love to hear others of you weigh in on this as well. Uh, what a receptivity are you finding among payers now to pay for the form of assistance that you are providing? And also, frankly, among clinicians, because uh, I, I work a lot in the innovation sphere myself, and I find that there's people complain about payers not paying for this, but there is often as much resistance to this on the clinical side of sort of adapting new modes of reaching people, and, and, and frankly, a deep-seated suspicion of technology much of the time. So I'd love to hear you comment on that. So I've been in healthcare for over 20 years, and I'd start with a phrase I think is incredibly important for us as a, as a company, which is you have to respect what's there but not have reverence for it. And what that means is you have to know how things work today if you intend to change it. But if you're going to change it, you can't have reverence for it because otherwise you won't change it. So what that means is when we think about payers, when we think about clinicians, we respect what's there today, and we are conscious that what we need to provide is value before we'll be adopted. And one of the reasons we work with employers now first was because that was fundamentally an easier bar to meet. With payers, what we're finding is they struggle with two things. They struggle with the cost effectiveness and return on investment of their programs, and they struggle with member experience two things that we address very directly. And so currently, a lot of the payers we work with think about us as complementary and next to their clinical care management, which is great. And some of them think of us very exclusively from a desirability and member experience perspective, but still connected to what they're doing clinically. What we see is that that's going to evolve over time. Uh, we welcome the partnership with payers, especially when it comes to clinical matters. What we're really focused on is what we do today is not necessarily what we're going to do tomorrow. What we're focused on is how are we changing the delivery of care, and how do we make that usable for the stakeholders? And so when we think about the systems that our internal team uses, we think often about when external clinicians start working with it. How is that going to look and feel to them? Um, you know, it's interesting. You can compare the uh, 
uh, what Hugh Ma talked about with Robin and then what the Penny did with the um, oral dosage. And, and my sort of question is that when, when we go to do a, a patient, and this we find this in patient education, that we want to implement patient education, but the physicians, whether it be two different surgeons that are doing the same procedure but have very different protocols before or after surgery, or the medical oncologists have different expectations, um, you know, so doing the kind of rob in the inclusive process creates a lot of problems when we try to move this to physicians because they have specific things that they want done, regardless of whether it's data-driven or not. And then, but for something very simple like the oral medicine seems very attractive to me because these are prescribed and you can change the doses and you can change the timing, but those can be implemented for the person. So it seems to, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious if, if you're looking at expanding that to other things or whether, you know, how difficult was it? It looks like your publications have suggest that there's been a large time to develop this, which sometimes, which makes me think that there has been some resistance. So I'm just curious how that was. So I think it's, I think it's an excellent question and I can speak to that. And then also to the provider perspective, I think that, we actually have ongoing, I think it's an empirical question. We all have the sense that in general, the provider community is somewhat skeptical about these sorts of uh, innovative technologies entering their clinical sphere. Um, but we actually are conducting implementation work, qualitative work, assessing provider perspectives on artificial intelligence, chatbots, all of these sorts of things. So we'll have an answer hopefully soon. Um, but I would also add that one of the, I think one of the reasons um, why this, w w you know, we were asked to discuss this particular technology is that in some sense we cut out the provider or the medical oncologist. Um, I don't mean it literally, but largely this was a pharmacist-led, nurse-led intervention. Um, and when it's working well, the only time the physician intercedes is when, in fact, they would want to intercede um, because symptoms are escalating in such a way that really it demands the physician's uh, attention, if, if, if you will. So I think in some ways that ability of, of the chatbot to triage and allow the um, people to work, so, so to speak, at the top of their license in some sense, I think has actually been one of the early successes of the program. Um, I could add that I uh, agree on both points, that I think there is some resistance within the, in my experience, I'm, all of my research is in the oncology community, and generally providers, including nurses, don't necessarily see this as an adjunct. They see it as a threat to some extent, saying, I wasn't doing a good job, and so they don't immediately welcome it, which suggests that involving clinicians very closely in the development so they own it. I also think it takes some political activity to get it highlighted, um, to maybe create demand on the form of caregivers if they hear about it. So I think, again, it's that issue of change is hard, and so you have to more than just publish what you've done. You really do have to create a community that talks about it and sort of overcomes some of those implementation things. And yes, one of the issues is where is reimbursement going to come in a fee for service? There have been some advances in payment for looking at patient reported outcomes that were remotely monitored, but it's not at a level that it's an incentive or what it really costs because if you are getting remote data, we don't have an organization very well within oncology that is set up to immediately respond to that. In the studies we've done, because we've done studies with people on active chemotherapy, they're reporting their own patient outcomes and receiving coaching. And then what we found is that we had to employ nurse practitioners within our studies to respond so that we made sure that the outreach to intensify symptom management occurred. And we don't, the, one of the things is that we make the assumption in current cancer care and for the years we've done it that telephone triage is how we find out what's happening with our patients at home. So in one of our studies we looked at the control group and we looked at when they had moderate to severe symptoms and we would expect it was appropriate to notify their provider and they only called, because we found out what they did, 5% um, of the time. So as you know, much of the outpatient home care is based in the emergency department. So patients wait until it's not tolerable. 
it's the adult child who's taking care of their parent and gets home at six o'clock and things are out of control and they spend the evening in the emergency department. And so uh, our current system doesn't work and yet the reimbursement to really set up a way using technology to make it effective is also not embraced within fee-for-service. Just um, to take a stab at synthesizing all of your comments, it would be instructive to think about what are the optimal uh, environments at every respect that would enable the advent of technology more into the care for system. Because it's not going to be a natural act, clearly, from what you've said. And so thinking about some combination of user-centered design and supports and payment experiments, et cetera, et cetera, all, all of the above I think would be really great. And you are obviously the right people to start thinking about all of that if you haven't already. Kathy, I wanted to ask you a, a follow-up question to something you just said, which I thought was really insightful. Um, you talked about these early adopters of the technology, and, and many of you are, are, are also in that situation where you're developing the technology and you're working with early adopters. And you engage the early adopters in the design of the application, determining what those thresholds should be so that they don't feel threatened by the process. But once you've had those early adopters and now you're trying to disseminate your work beyond that first group, you now have the challenge of trying to convince this other group that the thresholds chosen by this other group are the right ones. Um, I'm curious how you're thinking about this um, as, you're, as you're thinking about how you can scale it beyond what your initial groups. Well, first one of the things I'll comment is that when you use technology, you make it infinitely scalable. So coming from Utah, we monitor symptoms in people who live 100 miles from the cancer center, and we can respond to them. And so, and they get the same intervention, they hear the same algorithm-based uh, coaching as everyone. And so using technology really um, overcomes a lot of the divide we have uh, within providing outreach to uh, people wherever they live. Um, and I think, you know, for years that's limited what we could do in trying to, to help people in their home setting. But to answer your question specifically, one of the things we've done is we are just redoing our whole platform. Um, and it, the data that I showed from the hospice study was an IVR system, so a telephone-based system done um, using um, uh, you, so you didn't have to have the internet to connect. And so it was a telephone-based system which made it most outreachable. In the first study we did 15 years ago, our first patient lived in a remote area of Utah where they did not have running water, but they did have a line, landline telephone. And so they could participate in this study. Um, and so what we are doing, though, is to make it on all platforms available. So there'll be an app, there'll be web access, there'll be the IVR system. And then we have made it incredibly customizable so that it could do oral adherence. It could do whatever constellation of symptoms. In fact, it could get so that in a practice that had different chemotherapy with different chemotherapy, uh, it could be easily programmed, not needing a very expensive programmer to do it, to do the actual um, symptoms that you wanted to assess and the coaching that you wanted to provide to them. So all of that is now possible um, on something that can be readily adopted by a practice. And so that sort of to address if people wanted to use it, it isn't like trying to customize Epic in, in this, you actually can do it and you can have agreement on what the coaching should be um, to actually be able to utilize the system. So we hope that will make it something more that the practice or whoever is involved with it feels they can design it for their specific needs and patient needs. So if I could add I, I, to that. I, I, I just want to say one thing. My, my heart goes out to our colleague, Matt, from Epic, who was very kind enough to come here today. Thank so you. I do want to say he's here because he does want to hear everything we have to say, but we do tend to bash it a lot. But, Matt, thank you for being here. We really do appreciate it. And, and, and we realize that, you know, you've responded to many needs. Um, 
you know, and appreciate that. It's a complicated world for you as well as us. So I wanted to rephrase Mia's question. Um, Steve Jobs, you know, basically said, you know, don't ask people what they want because they don't know what they want. Um, we'll figure out what they want and they'll be happy with it. And, you know, none of us venture out the door in the morning without our iPhone uh, or Samsung phone. I mean, that's become a staple of life. Even my 92-year-old mother has a smartphone and knows how to text. Um, so, you know, they didn't have to make that a requirement to provide care. They didn't have to make it a requirement for anything. They made it something that people couldn't live without. It was such a strong, positive experience and frankly didn't take much training to use, my mother being a good example of that. Uh, so for any of the people who were speaking about technologies, whether it's the bots or Echo or whatever, um, can you see a road forward where you would make this so beneficial to providers who, as we said, resist all change, all change is to be resisted, make it so attractive to providers or patients or both that a couple of years from now, everybody's going to be using it and it's going to actually provide benefit because everything that we've heard with maybe the exception of the goals of care for the VA have been small pilots. You know, none of them are getting to the point where they're going to be scaled up in a broad national way. Is there hope for that to happen? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so I think that um, for any of these technologies to reach a tipping point, and I'll speak to eConsult specifically, um, it takes a few, um, few elements, at least in our experience, um, you need, there needs to be enough of a burning platform. And in our academic health systems, um, access to specialty care is so dismal that finding some better way for the primary care providers or for the specialists seeking support from subspecialists um, uh, creates the opportunity. We also um, established a model that was very mindful of the workflow of clinicians um, and um, that's why we chose to do it in the EMR rather than through some separate pathway. Um, we have um, at our institutions now, uh, and again, it, we're in uh, just under 30 institutions across the country with thousands of PCPs um, now using this uh, across hundreds of specialties. Um, about 85% of PCPs are using e-consults on an ongoing basis um, in these centers where they've been implemented, but it's not an overnight sensation. It takes a very robust model so that when I figure out how to do the e-consult, and there's lots of training that goes into making sure people can figure it out and that it's reasonably straightforward, that they get a reliable experience, that they get a timely response from their specialist, that it's a useful response that helps with clinical care, and we train a small subset of the specialists to be e-consultants. It doesn't just go out to the whoever. We make sure that there's someone who knows how to do it. Um, so I think that that reliable experience is a cri critical part of it. Maintaining autonomy for providers is always going to be important, and so PCPs can choose um, if and when they want to do e-consults, and specialists can choose if and when they want to be e-consultants. Um, and so with the right um, uh, environment in terms of access challenges, and then finally the alignment of incentives around RVU credits, um, which were initially our, our goal and now payers paying for e-consults, um, I think that is likely to be the thing that will help to push this into scaling nationally. Uh, just one uh, editorial comment before we hear from others. iPhones were not successful because they were built in a burning platform, uh, right? They were successful because everybody loved them. So I understand the burning platform concept, and that's part of why we're here today and tomorrow for this workshop, because we think there is a burning platform, and that can drive change. But what I'm asking is, you know, can we... You know, and you sort of answered it, but can we get to such a positive experience that the inertia carries us forward rather than slowing us down? I think that's a great question. I think the number of times that um, at, at, at Stanford that a group or company or physician will come and say, there's this very innovative platform that we have that can do patient report outcomes, that can do uh, natural language processing, that can do these, there's all these add-ons, or do the oral chemotherapies. There's lots of these add-ons that 
um, are offered and are continue are so much better than what we have today. And then we'll say, well, that's great, but you look at the cost for for that uh, widget, and you look at the integration cost, and then and if you try to use it outside of the platform, if you try to use it outside of your EMR, it's a reentry. It's all the data needs to be reentered, and then there's uh, the physician or nurse or navigator has to open up a whole separate platform. So whether it's uh, survivorship tracking or patient report outcomes, all these different things are really valuable. And I think if we were able to open the EMR platform in a way that these companies could simply add it on, and these, all these pilots and all these things are all done in a very limited scope because the integration cost is so high. And so, my, in my opinion, the, the best way to achieve a real uh, acceleration, I think is what you're talking, where there's a drive to the, to the medical record and to realize the capability is to have more structured data and to have more of these innovative widgets added on. And so I think, to, to me, if we, we can make it better, even have a whole platform sit on top of it, uh, that we don't ever have to see Epic again and we can have an iPhone like that, that still communicates to Epic and no offense, Matt, I think, you know, this is something we talked about at the break. Um, but, but I think that that's the kind of direction we need to go so that Epic can still be Epic, but we don't ever have to see it. And I think that would, if the more widgets that we could add on that really benefit our patients, particularly with the data set that was shown earlier for lung cancers on ePros was very impressive. Uh, but that's going to be hard to do in today's medical record. Yeah, and, you know, you're sort of going to where I'm going. As Sam will tell you, I'm a great believer in trying new technologies. I think, as I said earlier in the day, medicine has underutilized technology compared to many other industries, and we're way behind. So I believe in doing this, but I also try to be a realist. And, you know, what is going to remove the obstacles uh, make the benefits clear to the people who are either buying it or using it and uh, accelerate its adoption in ways that benefit patients and benefit us. So I think keeping those considerations in mind as you develop these and thinking about how you would make that step is uh, an important exercise. If I could add to that. So the reason why technology has failed in healthcare is because we consistently look at it as widgets. We don't look at technology as a service or a product. And the reason why I think Dr. Schulman's correct about why the iPhone got adopted is because it's not a set of features and functions. You didn't buy the iPhone because it has a touch screen. You didn't buy the iPhone because it had a camera. And you bought the iPhone because the experience was better and replaced things and made things simpler. So when we think about technology in healthcare, we need to think about it as a service. At RobinCare, we're working with patients now internationally and, and nationally within the U.S. as well. And the reason we're able to is because we think of ourselves as a service, not a technology. There is a lot of technology under the covers. There's an entire engineering and product team that works almost 24-7 building what we do. But as far as our customers are concerned, as far as our users are concerned, they don't see any of that. Because we think about the experience, we think about the service, and what do they want to get out of it. So with all due respect to Epic, electronic medical record, that is a database. Now, if Epic becomes electronic medical workflow, that's interesting. To do a workflow effectively, you need to think about experience. So I encourage Epic and all the other EMRs to be more open. That doesn't change the issue of, is technology providing a service or is it a widget? And what history has proven is that widgets only go so far. Paradigm changes, service changes, are what change things. Amazon is not online Walmart. Facebook is not an online version of your community bulletin board. They are fundamentally different because they thought about what the service was. So if we're going to drive technology adoption, if we're going to make it better for clinicians in particular, that's a focus that needs to be up front and center. right? Because if, if clinicians are faced with widget after widget after widget, you know, someone had a picture of all the cameras on the dashboard. That becomes a problem. But if you're driving a Tesla or a Waymo that drives itself, well, that's interesting, right? So I think, you know, if I could leave the room with anything, I leave everyone with anything, is when you think about technology adoption, you think about care force, and you think about how we can drive better scale and impact, 
We need to think about technology fundamentally differently. I would agree, and I would say that uh, what I always try to, is that technology is the vehicle. And if you have a lousy intervention that you're delivering, it doesn't matter how whiz-bang the technology is. And so people are going to use what they find useful. And so to get uh, family members to call into the system for our hospice study for 11 minutes a day when they're taking care of their dying family member, they had to get something out of it. And so the intervention, always keep that in mind, the service you're providing. So I agree with you. Uh, Brenda Nevich on um, ONS. Um, and uh, Hugh, you, you actually captured more beautifully what I was going to say when I listened to the panel. Uh, you're an outlier um, because the panel really is made up of folks who are clinical predominantly, who are in care settings, and you're on the outside, and you claim that you're on the outside, that you um, are complementary. Um, and I think what, what you talked about in terms of service, you've gone, at, it seems to me, you've gone after really the end user, the patient, the patient and the family, and you've commercialized that in a very different way than everybody else is talking about. That said, um, you, you know, I can understand the Robins and, and transportation and, and some of the other things, logistical kind of things, helping with insurance, whatever. But you also mentioned symptom management. So what I'm curious about if, from what you're developing is where are you developing that from? You are not clinical. Your co-founder is not clinical. Um, I couldn't tell by your staff if any were clinical. So how are you developing your algorithms or your pathways? How are you keeping those up to date? Um, so that if it's complementary, what you're not setting the patient up for is a potential conflict with their provider when they go in and there's a you know, discussion. It's like, well, where'd you get that from? You know, so... So a few things. One is our job is to never be in conflict with the provider unless we see the provider is providing substandard, not against the standard of care protocols. So one of our, our most important advisors uh, who's now moving on to the FDA and so therefore can't be an advisor anymore, though, is Amy Abernathy, who I think you all know is being very involved in patient-reported outcomes, data. A lot of people think of Amy as someone who's very focused on data, but she's actually a supportive care person who got into data so she could do better supportive care. And so her focus on what kind of real-world evidence are you basing your actions on and what real-world data are you using to generate that insight underpins a lot of what we do. So the way to think about what we do is we don't invent anything. We actually draw on literature, right? The reason why our, our health tracker is based on ESAS is because that's the right science, right? And the reason why we draw on papers and I'm so interested in talking to the other members of the panel because actually our job is not to invent anything. Our job is to figure out how to package it, how to make it interesting and usable, not just for patients and caregivers, but also providers. When we think about providing the data that we're gathering about patients, I'll make a quick analogy. If I took every single person in this room and tried to assess your financial condition based on your interactions with your bank, the tellers and the ATM machines, I would have a very accurate view of how much money you have but if I had your credit card spend, where you spend it, how you spend it, now I have a real picture of you. The analogy to me is similar to what we're gathering in healthcare today. The EMR is the bank. It's incredibly accurate. It's very valuable. But it might only be 20% of the picture, right? And 80% of the picture is other things. We have patients who are low income, can't afford the copay on their pain or nausea med. If they can't afford the copay, they don't take the medicine. They don't take the medicine, they end up in the emergency room. That's not captured in the EMR, right? That's the kind of information we capture. Providing that back to the provider is incredibly important. And so when we think about clinicians, we think about being a service. We think about being a service to the clinician. We'll deploy the same user experience, the same designers, the same product people into that space that we do for patients and caregivers. Because what we do should make the clinician's job easier and better, not harder. Now, that's a hard thing to do. It's one of the reasons why we're starting where we're starting. Right? We recognize the size of that problem. But it's, I think it's incredibly important. Right? Technology needs to serve. Clinicians should not serve technology. Thank you. My name is Juan Salomão. I am a patient advocate. My comment 
is more of a global nature to do a workshop and not specifically for this session. And technology can be used, of course, to the high-end Silicon Valley level, but there are technology, technological devices that are being underutilized. I give you the example, and uh, Dr. Katrin Schmeller, who made a good presentation uh, on ECHO, can confirm it. The cell phone with its camera, the smartphone, is the device that is used for training, for exams, is the device that is used to capture image that are sent through video conference so that in Houston and the other place, they can look at that image and say whether they are good cells or cells or that might be carcinogenic. So I'm not a clinician, I'm an engineer by training, so I'm not uh, well versed in all the termino terminology. Another example of how the existing technology can be fully used for the benefit of the, the patient is an example of a hospital in Maputo, Mozambique, where a patient, when went to for routine gynecological exams or the exams, had the biopsy samples taken, and they were expected, they were supposed to be called back so that they would be told whether the, uh, the exams, the lab exams, showed good signs or bad signs, and the proper care or attention would follow after that. And they could not be called because at the hospital in question, in the Mozambican capital, one of the hospitals in the, in the periphery, it was said that there was no phone to call these patients until there was an offer of a cell phone through which patients were called, and in a, of 100 patients that were called, I think that at least 80 patients were called less than 24 hours in advance, were called on Friday after 4 p.m., and on Saturday, Saturday morning, and Saturday afternoon, there were there eight uh, patients at least for the, for the report, for the appointment with their doctors. So this is to say it's commendable to hear of all the possibilities, additional advances that can be gained with more research in technology, but at the same time, the existing technology can be useful and it is really proving useful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Len Lichtenfeld and uh, I'm with the American Cancer Society. And I just want to share that I've been sitting here today listening to all of the conversations. And in fact, by the way, we can talk about pharmacists later on because I trained a long time ago and the pharmacist was right there with us when we were training. And it was a huge advantage. It's amazing that X number of years later, we're still having that conversation. But I, you know, I'm reflecting on a couple things and I'll, I'll try to be brief. I'm trying to compose my thoughts as I'm speaking here. I've sat here today and I've, I've, I've actually sat um, not only as a physician and not only as a patient advocate, but as a patient. Um, I'm not a cancer patient. I've had some skin cancers or whatever, but certainly not to the extent. But as a normal, ordinary patient, and I'm just going to share, I don't know that that point of view, I think we've had some conversations uh, uh, articulating the patient perspective. I don't think we've really captured the fact that when we talk about sustaining an, an oncology workforce, we have to really be thinking about what our patients go through. I will say, as a, an ordinary patient in a major medical system, it is horrendous. The, the, the perspective, and I can't, and I've written about it and I've talked about it, I have no idea how the typical oncology patient navigates this non-system of care that for the most part is highly transactional, highly fractionated, and really tough. And by the same token, I'm going to look at Randy because he's, 
He's a, a, a primary oncologist, been around for a while, and, and John, that we've talked about it today, the changes of what used to be you could do, and Larry, what we used to be able to do for our patients to understand their care, we can no longer do that. Maybe some can, but I suspect for most of us, it's really tough because of all the different moving pieces. And technology, to your point, has not brought us, not brought us together the way it should. And, and I want to reinforce something you said, you. I was involved in some startup businesses way back in the mid-90s. I came to the conclusion that to be successful, technology had to either make me money, save me money, or make my life easier. Three very simple principles that we tend to have forgotten along the way. And I detected a moment of conflict, perhaps, with what you were trying to say versus the question about how we use that technology. There are a number of innovative thinkers out there who are trying to take a look at what we do, how we do it, and how we make it work. And I think it's time we started paying attention to what the innovators are telling us. And it's not just people who are, quote, outside the system. There are people inside the system. There are major health systems, one in particular, Providence out in Portland, that's actually devoted a substantial amount of time and effort, not necessarily in the cancer space, but trying to say what are the products we can put together that make the journey easier for the patient. We have got to start, we've got to start thinking about how we can take the technology, make it work for us. The reason that you is in business, and I hope you don't mind me calling you you, but you can call me Len. <laughs> the reason that you're in business is because you see a need that can be filled. And that need may not only be Robin doing Robin's work, it may be a health system that takes that and uses that as a foundation for doing things. Um, American Well comes to mind. I don't know if you all know American Well. That's the engine behind the virtual patient visit, doctor visit stuff. Some people like it, some people don't, but we're moving in that direction. American Well isn't just a video system that sort of shows two people talking to each other. There is a huge infrastructure behind that. And in fact, that infrastructure helps power the, the Apple Watch and the atrial fibrillation monitoring. We need to start thinking about what we can do to make life easier, to capture that data, to improve the interactions, and take a lesson. You talk about Amazon. I mean, I talk about Amazon, the electronic record, because I think that they probably have that innovation. We have got to start thinking how we take that, that, that uh, opportunity, that capacity, that knowledge, and make it work, the virtual, the e-consults that we're talking about, the ability to take the information and plug it into a system so it's readily available. Those are not new ideas, but the capacity to do it today is so much greater. So I, I for one, again, as a physician and as a patient, plead that if we're going to make this thing work, it's got to work not only for the oncology workforce, it's got to work for the patients too. We've got to understand what they're going through. And what they're going through, particularly with cancer, is extremely, extremely difficult. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate those comments. Did you want to say something, Evan? I, I, I think that's a great point. I would ask uh, a, a correlator to that question, which is the information that physicians require to know today and that the amount of drugs that are coming out on the market every month for cancer and the complexity of molecular tumor boards. And we have... At, at Stanford, we co, we co locate all our doctors so that they'll have that team effect. But we, don't, we can't collate necessarily all the liver people and all the molecular tumor board people. And it creates uh, the, the complexity of care in such that I would also say that such a system has to be adaptable. And it's incredibly complicated that the care has gotten so much more complicated. There, are spe there may, may be a specialist in 10 years on immunotherapy. And you have to go see your immunotherapy doctor. And then you have to go see, you know, your, your targeted molecular tumor board therapist. I, I just wanted to respond to Len as well. You know, I agree with Len completely. I always agree with Len. Um, but, you know, I think one way to think about it is many of the things that make providing cancer care from the provider point of view difficult and frustrating are exactly the same issues that are making the patient's journey less than ideal. And so if we can fix some of those things, it's sort of a win-win situation. It's not that we fix it for the provider and it's worse for the patient. You know, if we can figure out how to get new patients 
in faster because we fix the way the efficiency of our um, clinics work, patients are going to be happier to get in faster. They're frustrated that they found out they have cancer and have to wait two to three weeks uh, to see a specialist to find out if they're going to live or die. The whole pre-authorization thing, for as frustrating as it is for the providers, the patients sitting there at home wondering whether their MRI is going to get improved or whether their immune uh, checkpoint inhibitor is going to get improve, approved for their cancer. So a lot of these things are negative impacts both on the providers and on the patients. And you'd think that that would be enough motivation for the system to get fixed. Um, but somehow or another, it uh, doesn't quite always work that way. Hi, I'm Matthew Katz. I'm coming from Lowell General Hospital. Um, one of the things that I completely agree with on user experience is it has to be easy for people to use. The problem is who controls it? And I think one of the issues is you look at Facebook, they've had all sorts of privacy breaches. Um, and I don't think that a pure solution focused on helping make it better for patients is any good if it doesn't also protect patients. So one thing to consider, and some people have discussed this, including I think Eric Topol, has been that patients own their data. And they can give it to providers. They can give it to clinical trial groups. They can give it to companies without it being used by someone else. So that's all. Sarah Burke in University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I, and as long as we're on the topic of usability, and I think that you know a lot of the technologies that you all have talked about are fascinating and exciting, um, but even when technologies are highly usable, um, they don't necessarily get implemented. We know that there are a lot of um, really uh, excellent, effective um, uh, innovations that don't get used in healthcare. And the opposite is also true. There are a lot of technologies that we know don't work that continue to be used. So implementation, there's a science of implementation and it needs to be harnessed if we are going to make good on all of the innovation that you're talking about. Um, so, so my question has to do with policy solutions. Unfortunately, in healthcare, we reimburse for some things and not others. And a lot of the functions that, or these cracks or gaps that you all have these amazing technologies to remediate are, are aspects that are not easily reimbursed. I'm not going to pick on you, Ron, but you know, or Ron can answer. There, there are things that are not um, traditionally reimbursed, or there may be complicated rules about how you can reimburse. And I think particularly for nursing, symptom management, and counseling and guidance, you know, just that, that phone call for the discharge patient or for the patient who had a tough time um, in an infusion room. So I guess sort of how, what do you think about some of the policy solutions that might help enable more high-touch care that might even render some of these technologies, perhaps render some of them unnecessary, and perhaps allow others to function better. What what would you see? I'm curious as to the panel members' thoughts. I guess particularly Dr. Mooney, but among others as well. Well, I guess I I hold out for valued based care, and that I have always believed that uh, the services delivered <coughs> by nurses and focus on symptom management, whoever it is, palliative care physicians or whatever would not be the least reimbursed component of healthcare. That it, in the last five years, gave me great hope that stuff that I've believed in and done research on for 15 years might finally float to the top. And I think the movement of palliative care, I think the demonstration that now it's common for us to talk about, do you routinely collect patient reported outcomes? I think Ethan Bosch's um, splash at ASCO really helped us. And I'm old enough that I see when you sort of pioneer a new thing that you have to put in a lot of years 
And you have to not be so invested in your own product or thing you have, but you see it makes a contribution, and other people pile on, and it builds and it grows, and eventually we'll get there. So uh, I guess I say uh, a, a, uh, I remain hopeful, and I don't expect starting out that it immediately is adopted. And, um, mm -hmm. But I do see progress towards that. And I do need, you know, say that our reimbursement system is missing a huge opportunity to improve the lives of cancer patients because of how it's designed. I think just from the, a surgical standpoint, we have a, a program at MD Anderson where post-op patients can communicate via iPad with us. Now, no one's reimbursed for any of that, but for every readmission we have from a surgical complication, we are not reimbursed for. So that's one way that it, it currently um, has helped us. I would agree that um, the right incentives will make more rapid change. So I know when <clears throat> orthopedics wasn't going to be reimbursed for hospital stays of, for all of the hips and replacements and all of that, Boy, did things change, and they were interested in home care. And at first, it was we'll move people to SNFs. Now they're in, we'll just put people in home care. So, you know, to me, that is the quick how did we get people to reduce smoking? We taxed it. So, we need some of these innovative, and so health policy people really have to help us to come up with what are some of those ways that really incentivize the system. And, and yet I am a little concerned that, um, uh, Scott Shipman, the work you, you describe that it took how many years to demonstrate the improvement in, in the economic and, and access improvement to now there being a path to reimbursement for the services that you're talking about. I mean, it's a path, but someone has to be willing to do those experiments at no, at no revenue. Um, Right, I think with with e consults, there were enough other um, um, benefits to the system that the systems were willing to self fund for a period of time um, to allow us to get that evidence base to um, to make the advocacy points. I, I would say though, can you, that, can you describe oh, what those incentives were? How how did you manage to align those? Um, what was the overall system benefit? Well, so the, if you think of the stakeholder um, as the payer, first of all, just to get that out of the way. Um, while they care about the, the beneficiary experience, really it comes down to cost savings. Um, and so we had to make sure that we were assessing in a sufficiently robust way um, was there savings to Medicare since they were funding our, our initial pilot. For the health system, um, uh, you know, if there was accountability for the costs of care, then those savings could be shared and, and there was benefit just from that. But we had to look at the predominant fee-for-service model too um, and look at factors such as um, the reduction in no-shows, um, look at um, the um, new patient visit volume. If you can take out some of the patients through e-consults and through other mechanisms in our, in our model, you can get more new patients in. You had to be able to show basically something that spoke to the bottom line under fee-for-service as well. Um, and um, fortunately, that there, were, there were some outcomes that were, that were aligned with that. And, uh, um, and so the, the systems were willing to continue to self-fund to develop that evidence base that we could then convincingly go to the payer and say, here's the, here's the ROI to you um, for your beneficiaries. We can show the past X number of years of, of, of savings. I, I would just add the, the risk of, um, so while there's been some success in getting payment for e-consults, um, CMS and the way that they've instituted the payment um, runs some risk of undermining some of the value of e-consults, and I won't go into the details of that because it'll bore people to tears, but um, uh, every success has to come with a few caveats. And the other is that, um, you know, with any sort of fee, new fee-for-service payment, which is the way that these have been approved, um, it runs the risk of misuse, um, which could ult ultimately cause CMS to stop using it. So if people start using e-consults inappropriately, not in a value-added way, then, um, uh, then CMS ultimately could pull the rug out. I do think that the value-based reimbursement or the, the global payment that gives much more freedom to how you 
deliver services to a given population or a given patient, depending on what's going to meet their needs best, um, uh, is, is likely to be the way that much of the stuff we've talked about today um, will get realized and scaled. Um, and we're moving there, but it's depending on your perspective. Thanks, Larry. So I get to be the, the last comment, I guess, um, and the t teaser for tomorrow. So I think this very forward-looking group is looking backward by continuing to focus on how do we get things reimbursed in fee-for-service. I think if you look at the healthcare paradigm, whether it be joint replacement, whether it be the oncology care model, for which I'm the clinical lead, whether it be ACOs, whether it be um, comprehensive care um, initiatives, on all of those programs that CMS is, is testing, what you see is a move away from fee-for-service towards value-based healthcare, where cost avoidance becomes a, a net source of revenue for your practice. So in the penny system, if you avoid ER visits, they are they, they help your the bottom line of your of your institution. So I would just encourage everyone to stop thinking in the present and the past and start thinking in the future. And I'm not here to make news, I'm not announcing anything. But if you if you look at the world that's that seems to be coming it's a bundled payment world where we give where we give a, a price for things, and we're we're doing something that's right for patients and right for for the healthcare system, it gets translated into the bottom line of the institution. So I just encourage us to continue to think in that way rather than am I getting paid for this piece of the puzzle? Thank you, and thank you to all of our um, for all the questions. Thank you to all of the presenters, and I had one last thought that I that I've been waiting um, to try to find the right moment. And actually, you were such a good segue. You know, we also haven't talked about the generational changes. And, you know, you used the word reverence a little while ago. And, and we have a lot of people coming up who don't have reverence for the current system and who are have expectations for this technology. And they will cause a huge change and because they'll demand it. And with that, I guess I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you all. Um, this has been a great day. Uh, we have breakfast tomorrow morning at 7.30, and we start promptly at 8. Um, and I just wanted to let everybody know that we have a reception now on the third floor. Uh, the elevators are right out back this way, and hope all of you can come. And Lisa has a comment or two as well. Just, uh, first of all, gr great day. Thank you, all of you, for being here. But it's also the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And the Academy staff has said, why don't we have a picture upstairs at the reception? So at the DNA stairs, uh, we're going to have a picture. Uh, so all the ladies, if you'd like to join us, I, I think that would be a great idea. So we'll see you upstairs at the reception.